record button. Okay, thanks, Tom. Thanks very much. Um, g'day, everyone. Good to see everyone here. We got 46 participants at the moment. So let's try and get the show on the road. I'll share my PowerPoint and run it. So hopefully you should be able to see a picture with a B17 in it. Hands up if you can. Yep. Good. Righto, let's get going. So tonight's talk is uh, Swamp Ghost and Friends. Uh, it's about the 435th Bomb Squadron. It sort of changed its name a few times before it got to that name. And they uh, flew across the Pacific and ended up in Townsville carrying out bombing raids. So they were the first uh, B-17s to operate from Queensland in World War II. As I said earlier, I've got a lot of slides to get through. Some of them are a bit busy as well. Um, so the talk focuses on the 12 B-17s which uh, became the 435th Bond Squadron which became known as the Kangaroo Squadron. Their logo, their emblem uh, had a kangaroo on it. They had their beginnings uh, in the confusion generated by the attack on Pearl Harbor on the 7th of December, 1941. And they journeyed from uh, the USA through Pearl Harbor um, and across the Pacific uh, and more or less the day after they arrived, they uh, made a bombing raid on Rabaul from Townsville, from Garbutt Airfield. Um, one of those aircraft was uh, serial number 412446, Swamp Ghost. And I'll talk a fair bit about Swamp Ghost later. This is the um, 12 B-17Es. They're all B-17Es uh, that um, made that flight across the Pacific to Garbutt. Um, you can see Swamp Ghost up the top left-hand corner there, and there's the serial numbers for all those, um, those aircraft. Um, this is a profile that I borrowed from Juanita Franzi. Um, there's a B-17E there <clears throat> in the red dotted box. It's got the Sperry um, uh, gun turret at the bottom there. Uh, however, the ones that um, we're talking about uh, had the remote Bendix turret. Uh, not the retractable Sperry turret underneath them. Uh, here's a nice photo that I found. Um, it's not one of the, the 12 involved uh, B-17s, but I thought it was a very nice photo to share. Uh, it's a pre-May 42 photo because it's still got the red meatball in the middle of the star there, uh, which caused a bit of trouble and had to be painted out later on, but it's uh, quite a nice, nice photo. So on the 6th of December, um, 12 B-17s took off from San Francisco to fly to Hawaii. It was a 13 hour trip of about two, almost 2,500 miles. Six of these B-17s went on to make up those B-17s that I showed in that earlier photo. Um, so there were six others that didn't become part of the Kangaroo Squadron. They were on their way uh, through Hawaii and across the Pacific to Clark Field in the Philippines, as part, uh, to Plum uh, was the code name for the Philippines. And they were part of a 10 squadron uh, deployment to the Philippines. They were stripped bare of uh, non-essential equipment. And so they had no guns, ammunition and all that sort of stuff and were fitted with long range, two long range fuel tanks in the bomb base. They flew in two groups uh, of six B-17s each. Six of them were from the 38th Reconnaissance Squadron of the 19th Bomb Group, and six were from the 88th Reconnaissance Squadron of the 7th Bomb Group. Uh, however, their journey was interrupted when they arrived over Pearl Harbor. Um, this is the makeup of those 12 aircraft. Uh, you can see, um, the, the, the ones in the blue uh, rectangles, hopefully you can make that out, are these uh, five plus this one here, uh, these six. They were from the 38th Reconnaissance Squadron of the 19th Bomb Group. And the other ones in the green uh, rectangles were from the um, 88th Reconnaissance Squadron of the 7th Bomb Group. And then those six at the bottom in this big red uh, rectangle, 
they later became members of the 435th Bomb Squadron. So they were six of the 12 that flew across the Pacific to Townsville in February 1942. Um, I just need to move something out of the way here. Um, the 88th Reconnaissance Squadron, this is the makeup of, of those um, aircraft, all B-17, B-17Es, as I mentioned earlier. So I've listed their serial numbers and where I know it and, and where they have one, uh, their nose art names as well as their pilots um, for each of those aircraft. Now the ones highlighted in um, khaki green uh, w went on to become members of the 12 initial aircraft that flew across the Pacific, which later became the Kangaroo Squadron. Um, so there were six B-17Es in this group. Then the 38th Reconnaissance Squadron, the other six, uh, they also arrived over Pearl Harbor on the 7th of December. Um, again, I've listed the serial numbers. I only know one nose up name and I've got all the pilots and only one of those aircraft went on to become a member of the Kangaroo Squadron. So there's four B-17Cs, they're the ones with the shark fin tail, and then two B-17Es amongst that group. So these were the first um, heavy bombers, to, uh, first US Air Force bombers, Army Air Force bombers, to engage in aerial combat uh, during the war in the Pacific against the Japanese. I'll, um, oh no, that's the next slide, sorry. Um, Swamp Ghost, which was a member of the, um, the 12 that went to Townsville, it didn't arrive with that group of 12, those two groups of six. It came a little bit later uh, on the 17th of December um, with five other B-17s under uh, an order to uh, proceed to the Philippines, which was codenamed Plum. It was also a B-17E. I've drawn a... Um, uh, map here just showing um, some of the um, the airfields. Uh, Halau, I don't know how to pronounce it, Halawi. This became an airfield, the golf course, Wheeler Field, um, Hickam down here below Pearl Harbor, um, Bellows Field, uh, there's Diamond Head for the tourist, peak, tourist uh, adventurers. And I'll talk a little bit about this radar site up here, Opana radar site as well. Um, in fact, on this slide, um, there were two guys, Lockhart and Elliot, manning uh, this type of radar, an SCR-270 at Opana. And about 7.02 a.m., um, Lockhart saw the largest group of aircraft he's ever seen on his oscilloscope. He contacted the pursuit officer at the information centre, um, probably at Pearl Harbour, I guess, or Hickam, sorry. And that was a Lieutenant Kermit Tyler. Uh, he told Tyler what he saw uh, and said that the, the, the group of aircraft were 132 miles off uh, Kahuku Point. Tyler in the information center knew that 12 B-17s were due to arrive in from San Francisco at about 8 a.m. around the same time. Um, and he told Lockhart, uh, don't worry about it. Uh, a bit unfortunate, but anyway, that's the way the cookie crumbles. Um, what I'll do now is talk a little bit about only the B-17s that went on to become the um, Kangaroo Squadron, uh, how they arrived uh, over Pearl Harbor uh, during the Japanese attack on the morning of the 7th of December. First Lieutenant Barthelmus, um, after correcting an earlier navigational area, arrived over the island of Oahu from the north at 8 a.m. As he arrived, 15 Japanese um, dive bombers overtook him on the left-hand side. Thinking they were being escorted by friendlies, the crew started to wave at the Japanese aircraft. Then they noticed the big red circles on the wings. Um, one of the guys on board was an uh, avid photographer, uh, Staff Sergeant Lee Embry, and he actually took a photo of two of those Japanese, two of the 15 Japanese aircraft. 
Now, I went searching for that the other day on, uh, on the internet and managed to find the photo. So there's two Val, D3A Val dive bombers overtaking um, B1741-2408 as they started to arrive over Oahu. So that same aircraft um, continued. The Japanese aircraft passed them and broke away and flew ahead. Um, the guys in the B-17 saw a lot of thick black smoke coming from Pearl Harbour and Hickam Field. And one of the crew members, Second Lieutenant Bergdahl, thought it was the most realistic drill he'd ever seen. Obviously, he probably didn't see the... Um, the Val dive bombers. Um, when they landed, Bergdahl saw a smoking uh, wrecked B-24 on the ground. He then realised uh, that it wasn't a drill. So that's actually a photo of their aircraft, as was that pre uh, this photo here. That's their aircraft on the ground after they landed. Um, and uh, that's some of the crew there at the left cleaning up after the attack. Different aircraft, um, why don't we do this? Uh, I've got stuff covering this. Why don't we do this more often uh, of the 88th Reconnaissance Squadron of the 7th Bomb Group? Captain Richard Carmichael, who went on to become the CO of the 435th Bomb Squadron, at that time was the CO of the 88th Reconnaissance Squadron, was the first of his group of six to arrive over Oahu. As they came around Diamond Head, they um, got involved with some moderate um, to severe uh, anti-aircraft fire, saw a huge fire, oil fire in Pearl Harbour, saw some ships on fire, hangars on fire at Hickam, and a large amount of smoke coming from the Wheeler airfield area. After seeing some identified, unidentified aircraft um, flying through flak, and several bombs exploding in the channel in the harbour, they realised that a war had started. Um, Carmichael um, decided he'd head for Bellows Field and arrive there while it was actually still under attack. So he wasn't able to land there and being low on fuel, he, he headed for Wheeler Field, which is a small uh, fighter airfield in the middle of Oahu. Uh, he spotted a zero near Wheeler Field, so he changed direction and landed at Halewa Field, which was that one up at the top of the island. Um, and he arrived there five minutes after Lieutenant Schaffen in 2430 landed there. Um, different aircraft, 2416 San Antonio Rose of the 88th Reconnaissance Squadron, piloted by First Lieutenant Frank Bostrom, who evacuated MacArthur from the Philippines. He was the last B-17 to, uh, to leave um, California, uh, but he managed to be among the first of his squadron to arrive over Hawaii. He, co he contacted, um, oops, contacted the tower, um, but they didn't, as when he was talking to them, uh, they didn't actually tell him that the Japanese were attacking Pearl Harbor, etc. So he circled uh, above Pearl Harbor and saw a ship on fire. Then an anti-aircraft shell exploded off his right wing. He got back onto the tower and demanded to know what the hell was going on. And they finally told him that they were under attack um, just a little bit later. Uh, there's a bit of nose art uh, that I borrowed from Michael Claringbold um, with permission. Um, so still the same aircraft, they dropped down to 700 feet and they were fired on by friendly fire from American ships. So they headed for some clouds to hide and two minutes later they were attacked by a Japanese fighter aircraft from behind. Uh, they shook off uh, at the Zero, but then they were attacked by three other fighters, probably possibly Zeros. Uh, they were damaged with bullet holes in the tail, wings, and in the fuel transfer line, flap rod and electrical wiring. They managed to outrun the Zeros, but um, they were now very low on fuel. They ended up making a forced landing on that golf course that I showed you on that map, Kahuku Golf Course, on the northeast tip of the island. So different aircraft now, the um, 
2432, uh, the last straw, was the nose up uh, of the 88th Reconnaissance Squadron. First Lieutenant Thacker uh, was approaching Pearl Harbor and Hickam when they noticed <clears throat> a large oil fire in the, in the harbor and a B-17 on fire on the ground. They headed back to Honolulu, towards Honolulu initially, uh, and then they received a clearance to land. He landed hard and fast at Hickam, blew a tire, did a ground loop to pull the aircraft up, and that caused the blown tire to catch fire. The crew members disembarked, extinguished the fire while they were being strafed by two Japanese aircraft. Different aircraft, uh, naughty but nice, uh, serial 412430, flown by Lieutenant First Lieutenant Schaffen, um, who was not far behind uh, Carmichael, saw the usual sort of stuff, anti-aircraft fire, hangars and barracks burning, burning ships, burning B-17 on the ground. Uh, soon, they soon re realised that a war had started um, and they headed north and landed at that airfield at the top of the island, Halua Airfield. Um, same aircraft, uh, Carmichael uh, and Schaefer, um, when they're on the ground, contacted the Hawaiian department who ordered them to relocate to Hickam Field. Um, while they were still at Halawa, they removed their empty Bombay gas tanks and put 200 gallons of fuel in their wing tanks. And they installed and loaded their guns because remember they, fl they were flying without guns and loaded them up with ammunition and flew safely to Hickam Field. Different aircraft, no nose up that I know of, uh, flown by First Lieutenant Rawls saw any aircraft fire burning B-17 as he arrived over Hickam, uh, immediately knew something was wrong, followed uh, as he was following another B-17, probably Bostrom in 2416, I think it was, he ran into anti-aircraft fire, uh, some friendly fire from some American warships. He did a 180 degree turn and climbed quickly Flew towards Wheeler Field, found it burning as badly as Hickam. He discovered, realised he was low on fuel after flying from San Francisco. He uh, turned back to Hickam. As he was about to land, he was attacked by a Japanese fighter pilot, fighter aircraft, sorry. Um, number two propeller was hit and the main spar on the left wing was also hit uh, by bullets. Uh, one of the crew members, uh, Sergeant Palmer, <laughs> got a bit angry and fired his 45 caliber, caliber pistol uh, at the aircraft. Um, three Japanese aircraft strafed the crew as they ran from their B-17, but they were lucky enough to make it all safely to cover. So that was Pearl Harbor. Um, things calmed down a little bit after that. But um, there was a lot of um, reorganisation and the various aircraft that um, were at Pearl Harbour at that time and possibly a few more that arrived a bit later were attached to the Hawaiian department and started to carry out uh, many patrols looking for Japanese ships or submarines. Now that's a, a nice photo. It, it's none of the aircraft uh, of the 12 that I'm talking about, but I just thought I'd show it, um, showing a variety of aircraft as well. Okay, sometime later on the 8th of February, so we're skipping ahead now to the 8th of February, 12 B-17s were detached from the Hawaiian department and they comprised six B-17s from the 88th Reconnaissance Squadron one from the 38th Reconnaissance Squadron and five from the 22nd Bomb Squadron. They were released to the Commander-in-Chief of the Pacific Fleet, Admiral Chester Nimitz, for operations in the South Pacific area in anticipation of you know, possible Japanese offensives against New Caledonia and Fiji. So they were attached to the US Navy. For all intents and purposes, they were US Navy aircraft and they were called by the US Navy, the Southern Bomber Group. However, on paper, um, they were still US Army Air Force aircraft and they had become uh, from that detachment 
known as, uh, on paper, the 14th Reconnaissance Squadron. Um, so on that same day, uh, sorry, on the next day, the 9th of February, Admiral Nimitz assigned these 12 B-17s that had been assigned, allocated to him, to Naval Task Force 11. Uh, and these uh, are the 12 B-17s that eventually traveled across the Pacific um, to Garbutt and carried out that first bombing raid on Rabaul. So these are the 12 aircraft. Um, same slide I showed you at the start, I guess. Uh, and, uh, and as I said, on paper, they were the 14th Reconnaissance Squadron, but known to the US Navy as Southern Bomber Group. So they were ordered to proceed from Oahu to Nandi uh, by the 13th of February. They left a bit earlier on the 10th of February. Uh, they left Hickam under the command of Major uh, Carmichael. He got a promotion. Um, due to limited parking space on some of the Pacific uh, Island airfields, they split up and landed on two different uh, islands. One on Christmas, one group on Christmas Island and the others on Palmyra Atoll for an overnight stay. So A flight under Carmichael, the CO. Um, so he had Schaffen, Schaffen and Brandon with him. And they left Hickam on the 10th of February and uh, flew to Christmas Island, which is now Cassidy International Airport on what is called Kiritamati Island in the Kiribati's. B flight, the other group of three, uh, which comprised Forker, Faulkner, sorry, Bostrom and Rawls uh, left on the same day and flew to Palmyra Atoll, which is now a um, small administration um, incorporated territory of the US federal government. Um, the other group of six were the X 22nd Bomb Squadron uh, aircraft, now the 14th Reconnaissance Squadron, of course. Uh, but also called Southern Bomber Group, uh, comprised Lewis, who was also involved in the rescue of MacArthur, DeBose, Roberts, Swenson, Eaton and Spieth. And um, they, they left Hickam Field around the same time as those other two groups of three. Um, so A and B flights back to those first group of the X-80, 8th Reconnaissance Squadron, left their two islands and flew to Canton Island on the 11th of February, 1942. And I've got some pictures there of the, the island, etc., uh, from Google Earth. Um, a flight then of the X-88th Reconnaissance Squadron arrived at Nandi on the 12th of February and B flight arrived the following day and caught up with uh, the guys from A flight. So by the 14th of February, the other two flights of B-17, the 22nd Bomb Squadron guys, previous Bomb Squadron guys, had also arrived at Nandy. Um, so now all 12 B-17s of Southern Bomber Group were now in, in Fiji. While they were based there for four or five days, they flew 16 missions uh, in support of that Task Force 11 that I mentioned earlier. So Task Force 11 was under the command of Admiral Wilson Brown, and it comprised those ships you see there, the Lexington, famous ship in Minneapolis, the Pensacola, uh, another famous ship in, in Indianapolis, and 10 other destroyers, too many to list. Um, on the, well, I'll just move this out of the way. On the 17th of February, um, the six aircraft that used to be in the 88th uh, left Fiji, and the other six from used to be in the 22nd left the following day and headed for New Caledonia. So, New Caledonia at that time was a bit iffy. Uh, it was considered a bit dangerous for them to stay there for too long um, due to the uncertainty of the French population's loyalties. There were two sides of the Vichy French and I can't, and the Free French, I think it was. So on the 18th of February, uh, the six B-17s of, used to be in the 88th, uh, got a weather report 
for Townsville saying things weren't looking real good. It was almost almost cyclonic type weather. And as they were only able to get an extra 800 gallons of fuel for each of their B-17s, they decided to fly to Brisbane rather than Townsville. So they left New Caledonia on the 18th to fly the 1,403 kilometres to Archerfield Airfield. Uh, they arrived there uh, on the same day. Um, Carmichael was pretty keen to get into action. He wanted to refuel at Archfield and leave straight away for Townsville. But Townsville at that stage was still being buffeted by cyclonic type weather. Uh, later that evening, B-17 uh, Naughty But Nice, 2430, uh, piloted by Schaffen, was damaged at Archfield when Keith Virtue uh, was taxing his DC-3 VHACB and managed to hit Naughty But Nice. The B-17 suffered some damage to its starboard wing, the tail and part of its fuselage, and it had to remain behind to be repaired. It eventually caught up with the unit um, in Townsville nine days later. Uh, so there's uh, the beast that did the damage uh, with Keith Virtue at the helm. And it also happened to hit, run into a Dutch Lockheed Lodestar serial LT922. And you can see it did quite a bit of damage to that uh, aircraft as well. It was damaged there on the wing as well. So the men camped uh, at Archfield in tents overnight. The next day, uh, the airfield was very still very wet there and their aircraft uh, were overloaded with fuel, et cetera. They decided they'd relocate a lot of the baggage to lighten the aircraft and, and most of the air, most of the non-essential aircrew members to Amberley Airfield as it had um, paved runways and they stayed there overnight. And the, the remaining five B-17s, remembering that one of them had been hit by a DC-3, relocated to Amberley uh, and they took off from Amberley on the 20th of February and arrived at Garbutt Airfield of the same day. This photo here, I managed to get a better copy of this. There's another copy around with a, a big tear through the picture up here somewhere. Uh, Bruce Campbell, the author of um, a book that I'll mention later, sent me that yesterday when I asked him. Um, so this photo was taken um, soon after their arrival in Australia, there's been a bit of confusion with some researchers as to which aircraft this was, but um, I think the consensus is it was 412416. And uh, I guess the proof is the fact that um, ex crew members some years ago have identified the people in the photo. So at the far left there, the big tall guy is Earl Shigrud. She who was the bombardier on San Antonio Rose. Uh, Rob Carruthers is the next guy uh, moving to the right. And the third guy from the left is Frank Bostrom, the pilot of San Antonio Rose. And Herb Wheatley, the tail gunner, is uh, right over here at the far right. We believe this photo was taken possibly at Amberley. Could be Archfield, but possibly Amberley. Um, so the men of the eight, uh, who used to be uh, part of the 88th Reconnaissance Squadron, found that when they arrived at uh, Townsville on the 20th, that three crews from that, that other group of six aircraft, the X-22 Bomb Squadron aircraft, had already arrived in Townsville. They'd flown directly um, from New Caledonia to Townsville through the bad weather. Um, there is a record that shows that... Um, Bill Lewis and Harry Spieth had arrived at 10 a.m. Uh, on the 19th, the day before. And it must have been one other as well because there were three when they arrived there. So that day that the, the last group of six arrived, the last group of five, sorry, because one was left behind, they discovered that they were actually due after flying all the way across the Pacific due to carry out a bombing raid on Rabaul that very night, leaving at 10.30 p.m. Wisely, the US Navy, because they were still under US Navy control at that stage, called off that attack at 8 p.m. that night. 
And there's a nice photo um, that again, Bruce Gamble gave to me uh, yesterday of Garbutt um, Airfield. You can see the slopes of Mount Louisa over there. This is Hangar 75, which is still there, the old control tower. Um, so when the 12 B-17s arrived uh, at Townsville, as I said, they were still under US Navy control, but they were put under the operational control of area combined headquarters in Townsville for flying sort of, uh, bombing raids, etc. One other thing to note in this picture is this, um, um, uh, what do you call it, a 50 calibre uh, anti-aircraft gun mound uh, that was erected there by the 208th um, anti-aircraft regiment. Um, they had a number of those around the uh, Garbutt airfield during the war. When they arrived in Townsville, the B-17s were dispersed off the airfield. Um, they went across the Ingham Road and along Duckworth Street and they were dispersed in the bush um, along, along Duckworth Street where the large uh, Townsville Air Depot or Depot Number no. 2 was built in late 1942. So remember this is February 42, so that there's a um, shot of Castle Hill in the background. This is probably one of the aircraft dispersed along Duckworth Street. Uh, I found this photo on Facebook two days ago. Very nice photo. And I'll be pretty 100% sure that's Mount Louisa in the background. So I'm guessing that's probably somewhere along the Garbutt end of Duckworth Street, perhaps just by the profile of Mount Louisa there. And it looks like they're getting ready for a bombing raid. So where I think that aircraft was is around about here. Um, so this, this is the main highway heading to Ingham. This is Garbutt Airfield. Uh, the control tower is just in here somewhere. And this is Duckworth Street. So they dispersed along Duckworth Street. They drew, if they taxied further along, they'd hit um, the stock route airstrip, which was sort of more or less almost built by then. This little road in here is a HFDF station, RAAF DF station. And I'll just mention that this is the railway line heading to, to Ingham, because that'll come up in a photo that I've got later on. So I think that uh, previous photo was around about here, perhaps. Now, that is that same spot there where I think that aircraft was parked. And this is what this Duckworth Street looked like in 1943. Very different. It was, had become the Townsville Air Depot. And that's only part of the Air Depot, by the way. But a very busy place, as you can see, full of B-25s, B-24s, um, all sorts of things, DC-3s. When these guys arrived from America, they weren't very well prepared. They didn't have any great maps at all. They actually used school atlases and shell oil road maps initially for their navigation aids. The day after they arrived, the 21st of February, nine B-17s and crews were dispersed from Townsville to Cloncurry, about 400 miles away. Uh, just for safety purposes. Uh, Lieutenant Roberts um, had a couple of reasons to stay behind. He was um, had to dig his tailwheel out of the mud off the edge of the runway. He'd run off the side of the runway and got bogged. But he also stayed behind to wait for Swenson, who was from the 22nd Bomb Group, group I think, who had engine trouble in Fiji, in Fiji and got left behind. Um, at Cloncari, they took over eight hotels to house the men because um, there were no camp facilities. They, um, by the way, they didn't have any ground crew at this stage. They hired drivers and trucks to help them haul men and equipment, the two miles to the airfield. One of the crew members, uh, Second Lieutenant uh, Johnson, described Cloncari as a hot, dry place of half a million flies per cubic foot of air. Don't think he was very keen on the place. Okay, the first bombing raid, 22nd of February, 1942. The B-17s relocated from Cloncurry back to Townsville. In the absence of ground crews, um, the air crew removed two of the four 600 pound bombs they had on board at that time and replaced them with four 300 pound bombs. Don't ask me why. Uh, Lieutenant Roberts uh, by that stage had uh, 
unbogged himself, uh, but in, in the process of doing so, he had damaged his tail wheel and the fuselage, uh, so he wasn't going anywhere. They were now down to nine aircraft. Now, while they were taxing to get ready to take off for the mission at Garbutt on the 22nd, um, Rawls, um, the, the left wing tip of his B-17, uh, 412434, swung into number four engine of uh, Bostrom's San Antonio Rose, 412416, and um, damaged it uh, significantly. Now, remember I said there were no, this is another photo that I just found this week on Facebook, I think. And it's a B-17, um, I'm pretty sure it's in the Pacific. Uh, and it's interesting that the two guys, or two of the three guys carrying the bomb look like they might be officers. Uh, I'm just wondering whether that's a, a photo taken in town, Townsville as well of um, one of our 12 aircraft, can't be sure. Okay, so though there appeared to be no damage to San Antonio Rose due to that ground collision that I mentioned, it was felt that the engine uh, may have been stressed and mightn't last uh, the mission. So that aircraft was scratched from the mission uh, and it was then from then on used as spare parts. So San Antonio Rose was no longer and you might notice in one of my slides, I, th I mentioned San Antonio Rose 2. So that's why there is a two, because Rose one got uh, retired. So its wingtip was used to repair Rawls's B-17. And from then on, uh, San Antonio Rose became a source for parts, uh, et cetera. Now, again, before they uh, took off, uh, DeBose found that his B-17 had water in its fuel line. So they were now down to six aircraft out of the 12 that had uh, flown across the Pacific. So they were to proceed uh, from Townsville th uh, that night, uh, just after midnight, uh, on the morning of the early morning of the 23rd, in two flights, um, two, two flights of aircraft, and they were to bomb Japanese aircraft in Rabaul Harbour between just after uh, sunrise, between 6:45 and 6:50 a.m., and then refuel at Port Moresby before returning to Townsville. The six B-17s assembled over Magnetic Island just after midnight on the 23rd of February. I believe the code name for Magnetic Island was Treasure Island uh, during the war. And the pilots were there as I've got listed. Um, some of the, air, <coughs> excuse me, some of the aircraft I, <coughs> I wasn't real sure of, took the first two. So Carmichael, Swenson, Brandon, Lewis, Eaton and Spieth. So about 90 miles north of Townsville, they hit some bad weather. The two flights uh, were, became separated about 120 miles out. Spieth uh, in 2440 got totally lost and he returned um, via Port Moresby to Townsville and arrived back there at about noon. That day, uh, just as a by, by um, bit of information, uh, Spieth and DeBose, uh, who, Spieth who turned back and DeBose who had water in his uh, fuel lines uh, dispersed their B-7s back to Cloncurry. Lewis and Eaton uh, reached Rabaul at 6.47am, pretty much close to time, and but found that um, there was a fair bit of cloud cover and the uh, smoke and steam from the volcano there at Rabaul was helping to hide the target. They circled for 20 minutes and Lewis eventually dropped uh, his bombs towards a 10,000 ton uh, Japanese cargo vessel moored in um, Rabaul Harbour. So there's a nice photo of Rabaul Harbour. Uh, you can see the volcanoes there. This um, Simpson Harbour was chock-a-block full of ships. Um, I should have found another photo showing the the number of ships that were usually parked in that harbour. But anyway, you get an idea of um, the layout there. Eaton's aircraft 2446 uh, had trouble releasing its bombs. So that's Swamp Coast, by the way, and had to make a second pass. Uh, he dro eventually dropped his bombs towards a Japanese transport ship. 
Um, he was hit by an anti-aircraft uh, shell, which passed right through the right wing without um, blowing up. Uh, and around that time, Lewis turned back to Port Moresby. Eaton was then attacked by about a dozen zeros over Gasmata. Um, he took some evasive action and his gunners managed to shoot down two zeros and crippled another zero. So Eaton, as I said earlier, was uh, in 2446, which uh, became later known as Swamp Coast. It's not a nose art name, it's just a name given to it by somebody. Uh, cannon fire had pierced the rudder of Eaton's B-17. It, uh, he wasn't able to get his B-17 over the top of the Owen Stanley Ranges. And he was low on fuel due to a uh, fuel leak. Uh, so he decided to make a forced landing in what he thought was a nice grassy flat field. Turned out it was the, Ag Ag I can't pronounce that, Agaiambo Swamp. Um, the other flight of three B-17s had arrived over target a short while after Lewis and Eaton. Um, Bad weather prevented them finding the target. Uh, they, they got attacked as well by five Japanese fighters and were badly shot up. Three of their men were wounded and they managed to shoot down one zero. They then returned to Port Moresby, uh, not releasing their bombs. And then they would have flown back to Townsville. The four surviving B-17s then refueled at Moresby and arrived back in Townsville around 2.30 on the 23rd. Um, later that day, uh, where when they arrived, they heard the news that Eaton's B-17, um, 412446, had crash landed uh, on the north coast of New Guinea. And this is an image from Google Earth that I took a number of years ago, uh, where you could actually still see um, Swamp Coast there. I don't know whether they've left it online or not. I haven't checked in recent times. On the 14th of March, the B-17s, uh, the 12 B-17s um, were reassigned from the US Navy to the 19th Bomb Group of the US Army Air Force as the 14th Reconnaissance Squadron. Just in time to take part in the rescue of General Douglas MacArthur and his party, and also President Khoisan uh, of the Philippines uh, and Vice President Osmina. MacArthur had actually earlier been offered these very same aircraft, but when he heard they were US Navy aircraft, he refused to be rescued by the US Navy. So a few days later, they were reassigned to the US Army Air Force and the same aircraft went on to rescue him from the Philippines. So out of the 12, uh, these two here um, were the ones that eventually got through Four were actually dispatched from Townsville to Bachelor, and then uh, when they got to Bachelor, two of the aircraft became unserviceable. One of them was Carmichael, the CO, so they had to stay there overnight. And the other two, only two, went up to Mindanao to rescue to Dumonte Airfield to rescue MacArthur and his family and staff. Um, this third rescue. This third uh, B-7 in here, 2408, went up the following day to, because they couldn't fit them all on because only two of the four aircraft went up. 412408 uh, flew up to, uh, to pick up the rest of MacArthur's staff. While the other one uh, that got repaired, Carmichael's aircraft, flew MacArthur from Bachelor to Alice Springs, uh, where he caught a train the following day. Found this photo on um, YouTube, no, sorry, not YouTube, Facebook. Don't know where it was, is, uh, there was no caption. Um, who knows, could be Bachelor. Uh, it's certainly a pre-May 42 photo based on that red roundel in the aircraft there. Um, I don't know where it is. So as I said earlier, um, some of the B-17s also went up to rescue um, the president uh, of the Philippines and the vice president. So President Khoisan and Vice President Osmina and family and staff. So there were three aircraft piloted by Faulkner, Spieth and DeBose. I haven't really been able to nail down which aircraft they were. Probably Spieth flew in this one, which is his normal aircraft that he flew. The, this group of 12 uh, 
provided um, a couple of B-17s to take part in a very famous mission. Unfortunately, it got overshadowed by the Doolittle Raid, which happened a week uh, before, uh, a week later. Um, anyway, just to set the scene, late March 42, uh, General Wainwright, who was the commander of the forces in the Philippines, um, I can't remember whether he'd, he might have been on Corregidor by then, I'm not sure, or Bataan, um, requested a squadron of bombers be sent to break the Japanese blockade long enough to allow the movement of supplies from Cebu to the, yeah, so he was on Corregidor, to the garrison on Corregidor. Uh, on the 11th of April, um, 11 B-25 Mitchell bombers from the 3rd Bomb Group at Charters Towers, which were equipped with auxiliary fuel tanks, and three B-17 Flying Fortresses, two from our group of 12 that we're talking about, the 14th Reconnaissance Squadron, and one from the 30th Bomb Squadron that came up from Melbourne, uh, took part in the, um, the Royce mission. So they flew uh, 1,500 miles up to Mindanao uh, under the command of General Ralph Royce, who was on board uh, one of the B-17s. That's him up the top there. So these were the two B-17s from the group of 12. And as I said, the other was uh, from the 30th Bomb Squadron come up from Melbourne of the 19th Bomb Group. And it was 412486, also a B-17. E aircraft. So they were involved when they got up there in over 20 sorties. They were sort of more or less behind enemy lines. They were, duck, they were sort of landing on whatever airfield they thought wasn't Japanese occupied at the time. Um, they sank a Japanese transport and possibly two others and shot down three Japanese aircraft. Um, as I said, they dispersed to various abandoned airfields to minimize damage. Um, the Japanese did manage to destroy one of the B-17s at Del Monte during a bombing raid, and the remaining aircraft then returned to Australia, loaded with evacuees uh, after their daring raids. On the 21st of April, 42, the 14th Reconnaissance Squadron finally, uh, sorry, became the 40th Reconnaissance Squadron, so it changed name again. And at that stage, it was still the only active heavy bombardment squadron in Australia. The 22nd Bomb Group had arrived a week after the, this group of 12. Uh, they arrived in Townsville and also deployed along um, Duckworth Street, uh, right up to the um, Stockroot Airstrip, parked outside of Dr. Rod Cardell's house, or his family house, his parents' house. And um, they were a light bombardment group, of course. And finally, on the 16th of May, uh, the following month, the 40th Reconnaissance Squadron changed their name yet again, and they became the 435th Bombardment Squadron, known as the Kangaroo Squadron. And you can see their logo up the top there. Uh, that's a leather patch uh, that someone scanned for me. These air, some of these aircraft were involved in a fairly embarrassing incident during the Battle of a, towards the end of the Battle of a Coral Sea on the 7th of May. Some B-17s of the 435th uh, were returning from a bombing raid on New Guinea. When they saw what they thought were Japanese ships, what in fact it was, was Allied ships that had just been attacked by some Japanese aircraft. Um, Calamity Jane, which was one of those uh, three, sorry, was one of a group of three B-17s from the 435th, dropped bombs on these Allied ships. Uh, 412440, which is Calamity Jane, later on discovered that they had accidentally bombed HMAS Australia. Their bombs uh, straddled HMAS Australia and some of them fell near USS Farragut. Um, HMAS Australia and a number of the other ships opened fire on the B-17s and expended quite a few rounds. I'm not going to read them all out. And... Um, then another group of three B-17s dropped their bombs near uh, USS Perkins. Rear Admiral Crace commented that uh, fortunately their bombing in comparison with that of the Japanese formation a few moments earlier was disgraceful. And I guess the Americans could say, well, your anti-aircraft fire was just as disgraceful. Of course, they didn't, uh, didn't get hit. 
The 435th was withdrawn from combat in November 1942. They had a pretty bit heavy period of um, operational duty and they were very, very war weary. And the men returned to the USA. Uh, their aircraft were reassigned to other squadrons. This is a nice photo of the men of the 435th having a party or a picnic at uh, Rose Bay in Townsville, um, which is the bay heading out towards Palaranda uh, on the 10th of November, which happened to be the day before they left Townsville to return to the US. You can sort of make out uh, Magnetic Island in the background there. Okay, talk a little bit about Swamp Ghost, 412446. Um, Fred Eaton and the crew uh, survived that forced landing. Um, Oliver removed the secret Norden bomb site and destroyed it with his pistol and threw it in the swamp. It took them five weeks uh, to make their way to safe, safety, um, battling heat exhaustion, etc., and keeping an eye out for crocodiles. So that was the end of that uh, little episode. Um, many years later, um, the wreck of um, Swamp Ghost, as it became known late, uh, later in life, uh, was refound um, by an RAAF helicopter in 1972. They landed on one of the wings and found the machine guns were still fully loaded on the aircraft and everything was still on board pretty much as, as left when the men uh, vacated the, the aircraft. Sometime after that, as I said, the B-17 acquired the name, the nickname Swamp Ghost. It wasn't its nose art name. I've been contacted by a lot of people who, a number of people who landed on Swamp Ghost and helicopters. I won't go through all of them, but one of them was Terry Wesley Smith. Here he is balancing his Bell 47 across the top of the fuselage in 1972. He told me that a RAF Iroquois had visited before him and removed one of the guns, 50 caliber guns, and left it with the local district patrol officer at Kiep. And then his, um, Terry's army unit, then took possession of that machine gun, uh, which they found to be in excellent condition. Here's just a few of the other helicopters that uh, made a landing pad out of uh, Swamp Coast over the years. There were and quite a few others as well. Uh, David Early, um, we actually had David as a guest speaker at one of our meetings a year or two ago. He was an ex-army uh, helicopter pilot, told me that he visited uh, the B-17 about six times uh, in his army career. By the way, David was chief pilot for Aeropower, um, who was a uh, contractor in Brisbane that w we used when I worked for Powerlane Queensland. And I flew many times with David um, in the Hughes 500 uh, choppers along our transmission lines. Uh, David's first visit was in 1975. He would hover in close in his uh, Bell 47 and occasionally load a passenger off to explore the B-17. Various visitors over the years uh, souvenired lots of stuff out of the aircraft. Um, Alfred Fred Hagen, um, began negotiations with the PNG government in the 1990s on behalf of David Telleshay, an aircraft collector and former World War II bomber pilot. They obtained a salvage permit in 1999 with a five-year expiry. Telleshay uh, lost interest eventually um, and Hagen persisted, but no salvage was started before the expiry date of that um, permit that they got. In 2003, uh, Robert Greinhardt um, advised, uh, convinced the Papua New Guinea Museum Board of Trustees that the wreck was deteriorating and needed to be salvaged. He funded a visit with, uh, Hagen, sorry, funded a visit with Greinhardt and others on the 21st of November, 2003. And after some deliberations, they commenced uh, salvage operations in, from April to early May, 2006 and they were a little bit brutal about it. They cut off the wings and engines and the tail stabilizers. So there's an aerial photo. I've got a series of photos here um, of the aircraft. This is after they'd flattened out and cleared a fair bit of the, um, the long grass in the area. A photo from along the wing. There's a visitor to the site one day, 
that they uh, discovered. See them there with a blowtorch, <clears throat> cutting away at the engine, cutting the wings off the fuselage. There's the wing dismembered from the fuselage. You can see the flotation devices under the fuselage and the uh, engine engine sitting in the uh, in the drink. Some of the perspex was almost intact, but some had disappeared due to the um, the hot weather, etc. There they are getting ready to lift something, and there they are lifting the fuselage. You can still see the red um, center in the in the insignia, and there's the wings left behind, and there's the fuselage probably on its way to lay, I guess. And there it is being unloaded, I guess, at lay. Um, so when the news of the salvage hit the media, there was a little bit of controversy. And that led to the wreck being impounded at lay from May 2006 until late January 2010. After much controversy, a, a deal was made and the wreckage was shipped to Long Beach, California. I think that's where Teleship was based. The B-17 then went into storage at Chino Airport. Another deal was made and in January 2013, it was ready for shipment to Hawaii. It was, an, it was going to the, what at that stage was called the Pacific Aviation Museum. It's now called the Pearl Harbor Aviation Museum. It was initially displayed outdoors at the museum on Ford Island in 2013. Uh, they eventually erected steel, made some special steel stands to support the wings and the fuselage to make it look as though the wings were actually attached to the fuselage, which in fact they weren't. Here's photos of um, the various bits and pieces um, arriving at the Aviation Museum in April 2013. And now you can see the steel f stands that they've made and you see there's an air gap here um, between the wing and the fuselage. For those who've been to Pearl Harbor and didn't get to the museum, it's just, if you throw a stone from here that way, uh, over the back of that shed, uh, you'd hit USS Missouri. So it's very close to USS Missouri. Uh, some more photos of uh, Swamp Ghost, uh, a, a close call here for the tail gunner. Um, they eventually moved um, the aircraft wreckage uh, into Hangar 79 to put it on display, sitting on those display stands. That's a photo I took when I visited there a few years ago. Um, it's quite impressive display, actually. Um, well worth a visit. So that was in October 2015 that I visited. I, made contact with Burl Burlingame, the historian there. He's since passed away, unfortunately. And um, we had a good uh, look at the aircraft. So you can see the large air gap there. And you can still see uh, here in white lettering, the tail number 41, They, never, they you know, the four's missing. That's pretty normal. Uh, one, two, four, four, six. Um, this guy here was my ride to get to the uh, museum. Uh, his name is um, Mark Reichman. He lives on Hawaii, uh, on Oahu, sorry. And he's written a book called MIA, uh, That the Lost May Be Found. He was kind enough to um, drive me there and he's uh, convertible. He runs a small business on Hawaii, a little bit of a plug if you go to Hawaii. Uh, get on to me and I'll put you on to Mark and he might give you a good deal on a on his personalised tour of um, Oahu in one of these um, nice cars. Uh, more photos of bullet holes. Um, you can see a hatch popped off here where the life raft was, um, one of the life rafts. More bullet holes um, there. Damage in the background there. There's Burl Burlingame. He was the historian. He... Um, he, I offered to give them a talk if they wanted one when I came over, but he declined that and said that he'd like to interview me. So they hired a, um, a, a bloke to video and they um, did a five part series, which they uploaded to YouTube. You can find that on YouTube. 
I'll talk a little bit more about what happened to some of these aircraft. Um, uh, 2421, which was had a couple of uh, nose art names during its lifetime. One was GI Issue and the other was Tojo's Jinx. Uh, it was delivered to the Army Air Force on the 17th of November, 1941. Um, as you know, flew from uh, San Francisco to Hawaii, etc., etc. Took part in the Royce mission, piloted by Rawls, with Jones as his co-pilot. Later on, that aircraft crash-landed at Horn, Horn Island on the 16th of July, piloted by Major McPherson, and all 16 personnel on board were killed in that tragic crash. One of the other aircraft, 412435, uh, you've probably heard this story. That's 412435 after it made a, a forced landing um, just near Sandgate at Decker Park. He got lost um, in a storm, in bad weather, ran low on fuel, sort of flew over Redcliffe and looked down and he saw what looked like an RAAF base. And it was an RAAF base and he thought it, the clearing there was an airfield tied up to this RAF base. But it was the RAF base Sandgate for training um, pilots, etc. And there was certainly no airfield there. So he ended up making a very bad landing in Decker Park and got very bogged uh, on the 18th of April, 1942. That's the only photo I've been able to find um, of that incident. Here's the same aircraft. Uh, it was later shot down off Boona on the 12th of August, 1942. So that's a pre-May 42 photo with the red thing in the center of the insignia. These two aircraft here actually returned to the uh, US uh, later on. Um, one of those was Calamity Jane 2440. It's got this um, very voluptuous nose art, you can see. Uh, it took part in that first mission to Rabaul, piloted by Spieth, and returned, had to return to Garbutt though due to the poor weather, as I mentioned earlier. It later on transferred to the 394th Bomb Squadron or the 5th Bomb Group sometime before July, 11th of July, 43. And it uh, was based on New Caledonia. So it was in a different theater of war, actually. Uh, <clears throat> it returned to the US on the 7th of March, 44, and was um, salvaged on the 15th of June, 46. Here's another photo taken while it was at New Caledonia, and it's a more mo modest photo of Calamity Jane. Her, her nipples had disappeared uh, in, uh, when she moved to uh, New Caledonia. 412408, um, there's a nice photo of that aircraft uh, and landed at Cairns Airfield. So this is after May 42, because there's no red meatball in the center there. San Antonio Rose, we've mentioned, was the one that was scrapped uh, after the ground collision on the 22nd of February and used for spares. There it is there. Um, there's part of the fuselage and there's the nose of San Antonio Rose in the background. Probably still at Garvard in the bush there where the air depot was built. 412429 uh, was one of the B-17s that rescued MacArthur. Um, in, on the 7th of August, 42, uh, piloted by Hal Peace, it was shot down over a ball and um, all, all of them were killed. Well, it was believed that all of them were killed. Peace was eventually um, received the Medal of Honor. He, in fact, had flown an earlier aborted mission to rescue MacArthur before the actual mission that did rescue him. Um, he managed to get through, but a couple of the other aircraft, one of them crashed and some of them couldn't make it. However, Japanese records have apparently revealed that Peace and one of the gunners, uh, Shesowski, had actually parachuted and were taken prisoner um, after their aircraft was shot down and they were later executed on the 8th of October, 1942, a few months later. So there's a shot of... Um, 2429 uh, off uh, Justin Taylor's website uh, at Seven Mile Airfield near Port Moresby. The last straw, 2432. Uh, nice photo there uh, of it being ready to be bombed up for a mission. 
Um, it had some gun modifications done at the front of uh, the last straw. Um, it was later assigned to the 63rd Bomb Squadron of the 43rd Bomb Group. And as I said, it was modified to mount twin 50 caliber machine guns in the nose from the tail of another B-17 that was probably scrapped. Later on, it was transferred to the 69th Troop Carrier Squadron in October 43, when the 43rd Bomb Group moved to B-24. So it was probably used by a commanding officer or, or as a, a general hack aircraft. It was later on scrapped in Brisbane in January 1945. Naughty but nice, 2430 down the bottom right there. Um, it was shot down uh, on the night of the 26th of June by a Japanese Irving night fighter of the 251st Cockat... I can't pronounce that. Uh, the only survivor was Second Lieutenant Holguin, who parachuted out and served as a POW till the end of the war. If you um, visit Kokopo, museum near a bowl, you will see the nose art uh, from that aircraft, plus the remains um, of uh, some of the top turret of that aircraft. Okay, second last slide, I believe. This is an interesting photo that I got off Bruce Gamble. Remember I showed you where that railway line was near Garbutt Airfield, just south of the airfield, near Duckworth Street, it crosses Duckworth Street. Well, here's one of the um, 435th Bomb Squadron aircraft. It was a later replacement aircraft, not one of the initial 12. So it's 412645, as you can see on its tail, sitting there waiting for a train to go past before it taxied out along Duckworth Street uh, to its dispersal area. Um, so this is my second last slide, sorry. Um, I highly recommend you buy this book. It's a a really, really good book, very well researched, called The Kangaroo Squadron, um, written by Bruce Gamble, who's written a number of other very good books. Uh, I believe from memory, Bruce's uncle uh, was in the 435th Bomb Squadron. So that's what uh, inspired him to write, um, to write that book, which only came out, I think it was last, late last year or early this year, can't remember. And that's the end of my talk. Thank you very much. And I'll happy to try and answer any questions if I can. Hello. Yeah, thanks, Peter. We're all still here, just uh, dumbfounded. <laughs> yeah, there's a lot of info. Sorry, too much. Too I've much. got a question for Peter. Too much info. Mm. Yes, yes, mate. Yeah, stay on here. Yeah, um, yeah. <clears throat> a few years ago, or many years ago, I was told that um, there was possibly, um, there had been a B-17, uh, which was bought by possibly a farmer after the war. It seems like a big thing, or perhaps it was abandoned in the area. Um, and that uh, I think some of the Haas guys actually went to look for it, the original guys. They found some of the exhaust collector rings that was all that was left. Um, do you know anything about that? Or have you ever heard no. or any no. idea what that would be? No, I have not heard that. What do you, you know what state that was in? I think it was New South Wales. Yeah, okay. Early surgeon, yeah. yeah. Um, outside Sydney somewhere, but I don't know exactly the details. Yeah. I don't think I was ever told. But, no. Um, yeah, no. I was like, oh, this is... <clears throat> no, I've not, not, not heard of any... Uh, no, mm. no, news to me. Well, it sounds like it was reasonably complete, or at least a lot of it was there. But, um, yeah. but it was removed by the time the guys had got out to search for yeah. it. Yeah, yep. Often happens. Thank you. Okay. Peter, it's Eric Young here. I'm thinking back on seeing Tora, 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 the movie, and there was a scene in that where the B-17s were landing, where B-17s were landing, and they, one of the pilots said to the tower when the zeros were in the area, what sort of air traffic control is this? <laughs> <laughs> Which I thought was pretty cute. Is this, this must be the actual arrival of the aircraft at the time that they were portraying. Is that, is that the case? Yeah, yeah, that would have been these 12 aircraft. Well, it's not the 12 that made the, only six of the ones that become the 435th were uh, part of the 12 that arrived at Pearl Harbor. Yeah. It's a bit confusing, but. Thank you, might drop out of your share screen, but uh, something's still building. Sorry? 
you have to stop sharing your screen. So oh, yeah. Yep. Oh, I just left it in case someone wanted to go back to a uh, slide. back to one of the slides. Yep. Gallery view. Yeah, if you press gallery view, people up the top, you'll see everyone else. There we go. Oh, so how many people have we got on board? Oh, we've only got 11. Oh right? no, 43, sorry. Yeah. A lot of chats. That was absolutely brilliant. I was riveted. <laughs> and it was so it was a lot of information, but it was so fascinating. Well done, Peter. Thank you very much, Mary. Yep. It's amazing the history that can be put together out of all those aeroplanes and sort of Yes. Yeah, uh, yeah. Someone's made the comment. I'm just reading the, some of the chats here. The the for that recovery of swamp ghosts, the, they used a Russian Mil Mi8 helicopter. Someone's made that comment. I I do have that in my reader notes, but uh, I didn't mention it. The Russian. Was my comment. I have several questions. Not all made it to my post. How old were most of those pilots of your famous twelve? as they were flying from um, California to Hawaii and on. They were very, very young, probably all under 21 almost, or around, under. About, or around about that age. Um, Carmichael himself looks from the photos like he might be a little bit older, but it's still in his 20s. Um, so, you know, he was a major um, in his 20s. So, no, they were all very, very young. And the two others I have in my comments, to taxi up Duckworth Street, why didn't they bog to the axles? How would a street cope with the axle loading on the aircraft wheels? I have no, I, I assume, uh, I don't know whether Jeff Nielsen knows, but I assume um, Duckworth Street was a dirt road in those days. Um, the Yanks probably later when the air depot was built may have paved it. Uh, I don't know whether that, uh, I've stopped the share, but whether you could see it in that last photo that I showed. Um, but certainly they did. They definitely did it. Uh, B-26 is, um, if you read Rod Cardell's book, uh, <coughs> in February, late February, they arrived the week after the B-17s and they taxied all the way up Duckworth Street, turned on to the Stockroad airfield and parked in front of Rod's parents' farmhouse there. And the B-17s uh, all deployed along Duckworth Street. Whether they went all the way to the Stockard airstrip, I'm not sure, but um, it certainly happened. And Townsville's a very dry place, usually, most of the time. <laughs> but you mentioned bogging off the side of the runway with one of the other takeoffs. Yes, I did. I did. And I've got one last question and then over to the others. And that was the evacuees in the B-17s coming out of the Philippines. How yeah. many people could you fit in and how did they fit? How many can you fit in a B-17? Well, a B-17 crashed at Mackay and there were 41 people on board. Yep. 40 people were killed, one survivor. So that's, and they were also loaded to the hilt with um, food as well. So you can fit at least 41. So what were they sitting in, the Bombays or? Probably, wherever, wherever they could. Right, uh, thanks. Over By the way, on, on, on Townsville, being dry most of the time, it, it's one of its nicknames is Brownsville. Uh, it is sometimes called Brownsville. But it can get very wet on occasions. But I grew up there and every time you saw storm clouds, it only rained on the other side of Mount Stewart. It really <laughs> made it through to my place. <laughs> yeah, Roderick, in, in uh, relation to Duckworth Street, um, just before World War II, Duckworth Street was no more than a couple of wheel tracks mm. running through the, the Chinese apples uh, mm. bushes. Um, as part of the air depot there, they, they built quite a wide taxiway. Um, I can remember in the 1950s when I was riding around there on my bike, uh, still at school, um, all of Duckworth Street uh, was one huge taxiway, quite wide, and there are pictures of uh, B-17s um, that you can see on some of um, 
some of the pictures that the aerial photos that we've that we've seen, um, and there were also several very large areas of hard stand. Yep. Um, Where everyone in Townsville learnt to drive. Yes, that's, <laughs> that's right. Yeah, it, there was one. That one uh, was um, oh, probably about ten or fifteen acres in uh, in area. And uh, yes, everybody learned to drive there because it was just one huge, uh, it wasn't just bitumen either. It was a very solid concrete, solid concrete. Uh, bitumen yeah. concrete. Yeah, so all this, all this area and here it. was all concrete. Yeah, that, that, that row of B25s there, um, there's an interesting story about that. That's on a, a, another road that uh, didn't exist and they built all of that area practically all of the area you can see there is bitumenized or reinforced in some way. Um, when General Kenny was um, having a fight with, the, uh, with Washington about um, uh, fitting guns into the nose of B-25s, um, and they were opposing it and telling him why it couldn't be done. Uh, on a visit back to, uh, to Washington, he advised that he already had, I think it was 62 of these B-25s in Townsville being modified with 50 caliber machine guns replacing the, the bomb ammo's position. And I'd say that that's where they, that's, that's what all those B-25s are doing lined up there. Yeah, waiting to yeah, be modified. Yep. Yeah, waiting to be modified. Yep. Um, the, I don't know where the, um, Oh, the, the the area that, you, that Peter pointed out there where he thought the aircraft were dispersed, right down there, yeah. Um, there was a, uh, a uh, eventually there was a, a, a weatherproof hangar there and um, there was a, a big bitumen uh, taxiway that went straight out to the uh, threshold of the runway. And it's quite possible that the aero cobras that uh, flew out of there to um, repel Japanese um, uh, flying boats in the in the air raid on Townsville. They weren't really air raids; they were more like a reconnaissance missions. Uh, it's possible that they was they were on in that area in in readiness to defend the air depot. Yeah. In, uh, the 1960s, the, the hangar had long gone, but that's also where they stored the Lincoln bombers when they were retired and eventually yeah, sold off. This is where they were scrapped. They were pulled yeah. apart here. I've got photos. Uh, yeah, they, right they, they, were, they were sort of dispersed among the trees and yeah. small trees and so on there. Yeah. Uh, Peter for, and Eric uh, Allen, just looking at the picture in on the screen, next to hangar R6, that looks like liberators. Yeah, who, yeah, they're liberators. Who, who were they? Australian or? Yeah. Oh, sorry, no, American. Forty third, probably the forty third bomb group. Okay. Yeah. Probably. I don't know if Bob Bob Livingston's online, but um, I think that's a liberator down the bottom here. Yeah. Um, that's it's a, a little funny. difficult to oh. see on this smaller photo, but I've seen the uh, the very large prints of these. Yeah. They were taken by uh, Arch Fraley. Yep. Arch Fraley. Yep. And um, I was able to find uh, Catalinas, um, mm -hmm. B-47s, B-24s, yep. B-17s. Um, I've got colour film uh, mm. uh, of this area uh, with Catalinas and whatever. Yep. Uh, it's quite good, actually. And Eric okay. Allen again. One other question about the lineup of all the Mitchells. They must have been no attempt to disperse them. They must have been quite confident to be outside of any Japanese attack. Yeah, yeah. Well, I think forty-three, mid forty-three. You know, things had changed a fair bit, yeah. and uh, Japanese were on the back foot. Yeah. There is another photo in that set that appears to be on Duckworth Street itself, and it appears to be a line of uh, B-24s, and they all look brand new. 
Yeah. As if they hadn't yet been painted. Yeah. A lot of aircraft, um, smaller aircraft arrived on ships and were erected down here. This is the aircraft erection depot area, I believe, down this, this way, neck of the woods. This was built first and then this came later. And this, this, what you see here is a very small part of the air depot. There's quite a lot more. There are many more hangars sort of back, back this way, uh, across the other side of the, the Stockwood airstrip, there were storage hangars and there's a huge um, barracks area for 5,000 men, more or less. Uh, there were three air depot groups based here, the fourth, the 12th and the 15th air depot. A lot of people mistakenly call this the fourth air depot because they get confused. The fourth air depot group was based there. It's actually the second air depot, number two depot or number two air depot or Townsville air depot. It's definitely not fourth, the fourth air depot, but the fourth air depot group was based there. The fourth air depot was actually in Darwin and the first air depot was in Eagle Farm in Brisbane. Anyway, yeah, Brendan Gowan here. Just a question I had in your research: the uh, original twelve coming over. Yep. Have you seen much uh, of the confusion that they actually caused with Australian authorities about their arrival? Um, I refer mainly to a cablegram from the fourteenth uh, of February, nineteen forty-two, um, from Osmin in Washington um, to uh, Minister of Department of Air in Australia, uh, where they're trying to clarify that these aircraft will in fact come under RAAF command. Yeah, um, well, I think you've shared a document, haven't you? Um, yes, I have. I had a very, very quick look at it. I had not seen that before. Um, I knew the history of, you know, that they changed command from US Navy to um, US Army Air Force. I assume there would have been a bit of toing and froing, yes. but uh, I had not seen that document. Yes, it, it, it seems, I'm still trying to piece it together a little bit myself, but it would have seemed that um, given that the US Army Air Corps had not fully established itself at this point and it was under, under a US Naval Command, RAF assumed that they would, they would, they would uh, come in and sort of take command of that. Yeah. Well, um, when they, Brett, Brett soon put a, put a stop to that. Yeah, yeah. So that's, yeah. Yep. Interesting. Any other questions? No. All quiet. Tom, you still there? Huh. Okay, well, good night, folks. Okay, no other questions. I'll. Um